All right, guys, how's it going? Welcome back. Back in September 2018, I started this YouTube channel, and my very first video was with a 2012 Range Rover Sport. So I thought, on the channel's two-year anniversary, it was only fitting to feature another Sport. So here it is. This is a 2010 Range Rover Sport 3-litre TDV6 HSE. The first generation Range Rover Sport came out in 2005 and ran until 2009. I was a big fan of that version, but the interior is soon dated. In 2009, they replaced it with this model, which ran until 2012. Then in 2012, for its last year of production before the new model came out, they facelifted it again. Now, in my opinion, the 09 to 2012 version of the Range Rover Sport was the best of that first generation Sport. The later ones from 2012 to 13 featured an eight-speed automatic gearbox, which I just wasn't a big fan of. It quickly became tiresome that, especially when coupled with the 3.0-litre TDV6 engine, or later SDV6 engine. I also didn't like the tailgate styling on the 2012 model. They'd done away with the split opening boot, which was actually quite handy, and replaced it with that horizontal metal strip. Yeah, I just wasn't a huge fan of that. Whereas I think this version looks far better. I think this version of the Sport is the best of all worlds. You get more modern, cleaner styling, you get a much nicer interior, and you don't have to tolerate the 8-speed automatic gearbox, this is just the 6-speed. You also got a much better infotainment system and nice features like reversing camera, keyless entry and keyless start, which just made it easier to live with. They'd done away with the old 2.7-litre TDV6, which produced about 190 horsepower, and replaced it with this 3-litre TDV6, which produced 245. Now, I know that's not a huge difference, but it is noticeable, trust me. The old 2.7 was a little bit gutless. This with 245 is just much more like it. It's still hard to justify the sport badge on the boot because it still doesn't feel sporty particularly, but I suppose it is more sporty than the big Range Rover. You could have also bought this one with a 5-litre supercharged V8 which produced over 500 horsepower, but I'd be wary of those early V8s because they suffered with dodgy timing chain tensioners. You could have also bought the 3.6-litre TD V8, which is the pick of the bunch in my opinion. Although everything feels much more modern than the, the early Range Rover Sports, it's still missing some important functions, such as there's no Bluetooth streaming. So there's Bluetooth hands-free so I can take calls and stuff, but I can't wirelessly play my music. You've still got to plug it in the USB slot, which is a little bit temperamental. The interior is lovely. Everything is finished in nicely stitched leather. Everything you touch feels nice and solid, and well-built, well-made. The seats are really padded and comfortable too. And the driving position, as with any Range Rover, is superb. You feel like the king of the road. If you're in the market for one of these sports, though, make sure you go for the top spec HSE model. Don't just settle for an SE because it's cheaper. Because with this kind of car, you want all the optional extras. You want heated front seats, you want heated rear seats, and you want a mini fridge here. These are all extras which, I know they're not that important, but they do make the car a much nicer place to be. I also like them finished in white. I know it's a little bit the only way is Essex, isn't it? But I think it suits it. Also, in my opinion, as I've mentioned many times before, try and Try and steer clear of ones which look like they've been modified. All the, the Carnes, the Overfinches, the Reveres, I would just avoid, to be honest. I'd try and go with a plain looking one. I know I'm generalizing here, but I just think the ones which have been modified have probably had a much harder life than the ones in a boring color with a National Trust sticker in the window and a Panama on the parcel shelf. If you find one like this, this is now approaching 10 years old. It's done 77,000 miles and it's got good service records. Well, here's what I'm going to do with this one, and I just think it sets you on the, the right path then to owning a, a reliable Range Rover. So I'm gonna get a full service done, which is what I would recommend you do. So oil, oil filter, air filter, pollen filter, fuel filter, change the whole lot, then you know exactly when it was last done. If you opt for a six cylinder diesel, like this one, then the cam belts are due at 10 years or 105,000 miles. So that's next on my list. That will cost around 300 pounds to replace that, but it's vital because if that snaps, your engine is goosed. Also next on my list is to have the gearbox serviced. Now I do this with every automatic once it's approached a certain number of miles, but it's even more important with a Range Rover, especially with this TDV6 engine. Because this particular engine, I'm sure you've heard about this, but if you haven't, they suffer with crankshaft failure, or the, or the bearings anyway, they can go and blow the engine. I know you're probably thinking, how could a gearbox flush and service possibly help the engine? But it can because the gearbox fluid gets so gunked up that it puts extra pressure on the crank. These aren't my words, by the way. These are the words of many forums and gearbox specialists who I've spoken to. So just get that done. 
that will cost you anywhere between two and four hundred pounds but it's vital now i say that's quite a common issue with this tdv6 engine it's never happened to me and i've had countless of these cars touch touch wood but i do know a couple of people who it's happened to so it's similar to an ims bearing failure on a porsche or something it's just something that i know is a possibility so just try and prevent it if possible lots of people love to tell you how unreliable these cars are but i've had tens of these cars and all right i've only owned them for a short period of time but i've never had anything serious happen and also i've never had anything any serious warranty claims on them either in the first six months so that tells you something surely i know for every one person out there who'll sing the range of his praises there will be 10 doom and gloomers who hate the things probably haven't owned one to be fair that's usually the case once you've done all those jobs i just think the next important thing is to look after it don't completely abuse it and thrash it and then check the levels and have it serviced regularly you'd be surprised the number of people i meet who think that an mot is all a car needs then they wonder why the car breaks down just service it you idiot beside me here is an aa man and he's rescuing somebody in a 68 reg nissan qashqai so you think you're better off buying a Japanese car over a Range Rover because it won't break down. Honestly, all cars break, just get used to it. All you can do is try and prevent it the best you can and look after them. Whilst I'm on the subject of common issues, the Range Rover has air suspension, which gives it its unrivaled ride quality, but this can fail. So in all four corners, they have what's basically an airbag, which pumps air from the compressor in the boots to these bags, which can raise or lower the ride height, all fairly straightforward so far. But these airbags can fail because they're taking the weight of the car which is quite hefty it comes in at over two tons the bags can fail i mean everything has a certain lifespan so the cost of replacing a bag is about 200 pounds you'd be quite unfortunate for all four to go but in its lifetime i suppose it could happen also the compressor which pumps the air into these bags that can fail now there are plenty of companies online who'll refurbish your compressors for between two and three hundred quid so again not the worst thing in the world also the airlines which feed the air from the compressor to the bags they can corrode over time and leak and then you'll get error messages and it might sit a little bit you know lopsided or whatever that's quite an expensive job to repair but if you take it to a specialist i've heard of a friend of mine had this issue with his he took it to a specialist and it, it was about it was about 1100 pounds to replace all the pipes but then it'll last them for another 10 years. So, I know these are probably frightening numbers for you, but these aren't things that go wrong every single day. It might, if you're very unlucky, happen once in the car's lifetime. It's just something that you should be made aware of. I hear lots of pessimists say, oh, I wouldn't touch a Land Rover with a barge pole. You know, to change the turbo, one of those, you've got to take the body off. Well, that is true to a certain extent. You don't have to, but it just, it saves time actually, because if you get it on a ramp and undo the dozen or so bolts, the body will lift off the, off the chassis, which just gives the mechanics much more room to, to change things like a turbo. It looks far worse than it is, trust me. Plus, I mean, how often do you change a turbo on a car? Again, it might be once in the car's lifetime if you're unlucky. It's not something you need to do every other week. Irene, bring us another brew out. Turbo's blown on Range Rover again. I've got to get the body off just doesn't happen does it so there is quite a long list granted with things that can potentially go wrong with a range of a sport but that's no different from any other luxury suv don't for a second think that an x5 or a kn or a Touareg or a q7 are any better because they are they all have these same issues and they can cost the same sort of money as a range rover it just comes with the territory unfortunately if you want to drive around in a range rover which i completely understand because why wouldn't you you've just got to factor in some of these costs I've had countless of these cars and I've never, not once, had anything catastrophic happen to me. Let me rephrase that actually, I've never had anything happen to me in a Range Rover that hasn't happened to me in any other car from any other country. The notion that a Range Rover is any less reliable than a BMW or an Audi is complete rubbish. Apart from the cost of maintenance, which is higher than a Golf, granted, you do have higher running costs too. So for example, to fill the tank full of fuel will set you back a three-figure sum. You'll average around 23 miles per gallon around town and maybe 35 if you're lucky in a motorway run. So it's not too bad, but yeah, they're not as cheap as a Prius. In fact, what have I been averaging today? Yeah, bang on what I said, 22.3 miles per gallon around town. The road tax here in the UK is quite high too. It'll set you back around 555 pounds a year, which yes, is higher than a Golf, but it's no higher than an X5 or a Q7 or a Touareg from this era. This probably all sounds a little bit off-putting, doesn't it? 
to most it will be, but you've got to think about the positives, and there are plenty. It's good looking, practical, spacious, good off-road, good on-road, and above all else, every single time you get behind the wheel, it makes you feel like a million dollars. Every time I drive a Range Rover, I feel like a lottery winner. I mean, now, for example, I've got... I've got five pounds in my pocket. And yet, in this, I feel like a millionaire. And there aren't many cars that do that. Of course, if you're a little bit of a lefty, you'll tell me that that isn't important. And yes, I know, thinking sensibly, it isn't important. Nowhere near as important as poverty or drought or COVID even. But it is nice, isn't it? That feeling of success and invincibility. It's actually quite addictive. And only certain cars will bring that. And of course, they come with higher running costs. Used facelift models here in the UK start at around £10,000 for a decent one. For one like this in a desirable colour with only 77,000 miles on the clock and good service records, that'll set you back, I don't know, between 12 and 13,000. It's still a bargain when you consider these cars were over £60,000 new. Because it just feels like it's got a lot more to give. I know I've touched on this before, but I'll say it again because I think it's quite important. If you're in the market for a Range Rover, or any luxury car to be fair, keep a couple of grand back. So whatever your budget is, if you've got a budget of 10, you need to be looking for ones which are about eight. Hold back a couple of grand for any potential repairs because there will be some. I think that's why cars like this get such a bad reputation because people buy them on a shoestring. Broke people, to be fair. Max out all the money on the purchase of the thing and then when it breaks, because they haven't serviced it properly because they can't afford to, then they're all loud and vocal on forums. It's just not right. I mean, what did you expect? So if you're a cautious Claude or a nervous Nigel, this isn't the car for you. Go and buy yourself a new Kia with a seven year warranty. But if you're a realist and pragmatic and sensible, there are some bargains to be had. I see those kinds of characters every single day at work, umming and ahhing about, should I buy this older luxury car or not? What if it breaks? Well, yeah, don't buy one then. This isn't the car for you. It actually reminds me of that old Marilyn Monroe quote, I think if you can't tolerate these cars at their worst, then you don't deserve to enjoy them at their best. So thank you once again for watching. Thank you to everyone who's loyally watched this channel for the last two years. I really didn't think two years ago we'd now be sitting at nearly 65,000 subscribers and regularly getting over a million views a month. It's mind blowing really. So thank you to each and every one of you who has liked, commented, subscribed. I appreciate it. Make sure you follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I'll leave the link below. And yeah, thanks once again for watching. Cheers guys. I'll see you next time.